Free Energy. A Final Resolution. Thor Fabian Pettersson, 2017. Free Energy, A Final Resolution, ebook. Copyright Thor Fabian Pettersson, 2017. Layout, Thor Fabian Pettersson. ISBN 978-82-690445-6-0. Preface. This work is a summary into my philosophizing on the topic of free energy. If you want more details, then look up my previous work. In this work, I will simply start from scratch and work my way to your fresh, new, free energy powered car. By scratch, I mean, from the beginning of time. I want true understanding, which can only come from taking it all in at once, po. Therefore, we need to begin at the beginning itself. I will try to be concise and not use too many words and write in plain English. This work should be as short as possible because I want you to take it all in in one breath. Q, but why should we bother with free energy? A, in the short run, we will get free, clean energy, free food, free clothes, free stuff, no more poverty, and no more pollution, which means no more global warming. Money would be a thing of the past. With all that surplus, we would also be able to evolve into a kinder and more loving animal. Thus, it also may mean the end of suffering, or, at least, the end of war. In short, nothing less than the dawn of the cosmic man. In the long run, we would be able to travel from galaxy to galaxy in the space of a second. As free energy, not only powers your spacecraft forever, it is also the ultimate warp drive, which you will read about in this work. And after that, free energy may provide a means to live forever, even after the universe dies. That is, the Buddha is a thing of reality. See my earlier work. Q, would not free energy be dangerous? A, to that I reply, no more than our gazillion bombs. If we want to kill ourselves, then we can do that with or without the aid of free energy. However, to the spacefaring community, if they are up there, then we would become a major threat. Free energy can totally bend space-time, which means we can totally destroy planets. Q, and you want to put that device in old grandma's car? A, yes. Q, have you thought this through? A, no. Proposition 1, nature is a boneless animal. I.e., the cuboctahedron is the lack of solidity. Due to the lack of evolution, structure, in the cosmic dawn, viz., the beginning of time, we can find no dam, structure, that can prevent motion from existing. This lack of structure is, by default, the cuboctahedron, the dual torus. The cuboctahedron equals motion. That is what the cuboctahedron is. The cuboctahedron is the lack of solidity. Thus, motion is inherent in nature. Motion always was. Proposition 2, motion always was. If motion ever was, then the universe is eternal. It follows. No. The universe is not eternal because that would imply infinite regress, e.g., the atom started over here. No. The atom started over there. No ad infinitum, which is a paradox. Nature knows no paradox, therefore, the eternal universe cannot be. That is, there is something else besides the universe that resolves the inherent logic in Proposition 2, and that something else is also eternal. And that something must necessarily resolve the issue of the infinite regress. The only player we have is motion. Therefore, motion must solve the issue of infinite regress. Proposition 3, nature knows no paradox. Proposition 4, the eternal universe cannot be. Proposition 5, there is something besides the universe. Proposition 6, motion must solve the issue of infinite regress. Motion, which is really the cuboctahedron, solves the issue by spinning. The cuboctahedron spins so fast that, from the point of view of the fastest spin, there is no universe, there is only blackness or nothingness. In other words, the atom, S, started in a state that knows no extension of space-time and therefore the question, did the atom start over here, falls apart as there is no here as here requires the extension of space-time. Nothingness is therefore space-time that is curled up into this knot of zero propagation. The knot is being held that way by the fast spin. Nothingness is the fastest spin in existence therefore you cannot exceed the zero propagation of space-time. Alternatively, if you did, you would get more zero, which is meaningless. Proposition 7, we came from nothingness. Proposition 8, nothingness is the fastest spin in existence. Q, how did the spin start to spin? A, it never started. It was always so. Nevertheless, this is not a paradox when viewed from the point of view of nothingness, as there is no spin in that picture. What the picture does contain, however, is something that is extremely hot, and note, forever. It has been hot forever. In addition, this core cannot become cold. That is, it cannot die. Nature has always been animate. That is, nothingness has real eternal properties. In this sense, we can see how the nothingness slash the motion can just be slash exist when it is, in its core, motionless, due to spinning so fast. This state of motionlessness slash timelessness has no spatial extension and therefore it has no clocks running for it, so just existing is not a paradox for it. However, it is still puzzling why there is existence rather than non-existence. The key, I believe, is to understand the nature of motionlessness. That is, if you could make motionlessness with no motion at all, then I imagine that non-existence would apply and we would be one with oblivion forever. However, I believe that true logic and nature will tell us that that is not possible. It is not possible to create motionlessness slash nothingness that way. The only way to create motionlessness is with fast motion, as we have seen. And that answers the big question, 
why is there anything at all? Or, even deeper, why is there nothingness? Q, but why can't you create motionlessness without motion or with no motion? A, if you tried that I imagine that you would get something akin to Zeno's paradoxes, that is, a totally bizarre, illogical, fragmented, dead and paradoxical picture. Nature does not believe in paradoxes and therefore existence is. The philosophers say that nothingness is nothing at all, period. Well, that is absurd because then you are using your will and words to define what nothingness is. Let nature define what nothingness is just like nature defines what speed limit there is. Proposition 9, nothingness has properties. Q, but is this nothingness real nothingness? A, it is. Imagine if you strip away all space-time, then even the darkness is gone. This picture truly contains no thing. That is what nothingness is. If the philosophers say otherwise, then that is fine too. For them, nothingness is more akin to non-existence. However, non-existence cannot be because we have no fairies that can build a dam to contain the cuboctahedron. Paradoxically, if you wanted to create non-existence, then I imagine you would need some sort of a structure therefore no structure equals the cuboctahedron. Proposition 10, if you truly understand the cuboctahedron, then you know how all things began. The cuboctahedron has spun since eternity. However, a spin requires a net, body, like a whirlpool. And a cosmic whirlpool is exactly what it is. So you see how the space-time is generated from the nothingness because the space-time is simply motion that cannot keep up with the fast pace in the toroidal center. So the universe, we, exists because of a major traffic jam. That should make you feel special. Like in a whirlpool, the center is fast. The edge is slow. This slower pace makes space-time possible. Alternatively, this slower pace is space-time. Proposition 11, space-time exists because of a cosmic traffic jam. If this picture is correct, then we have a big torus, our universe, in which the center is nothingness. This center gives rise to space-time because the motion competes for a place in the toroidal center. The losers get left out. The losers equals space-time, which are the wings of the torus. The space-time returns, competes anew, to the center because of the perpetual spin, motion is inherent in nature, of the nothingness. Then we repeat the cycle for eternity. Therefore, we get a universe that is born, then dies, and then is reborn forever. Nature likes to be nothing. The universe is the big loser. Q, why does the motion compete for a place in the toroidal center? A, because the body that is motion continues to move at a constant velocity unless acted upon. Q, why does it do that? A, imagine if nothingness has spun forever, no dam, and there is no one else. Then, we have nothing or no one else to change the picture with. Therefore, the picture remains as it is. This is the key to free energy. The body that is motion continues to move at a constant velocity unless acted upon. This is Newton's first law of motion. However, there is nothing besides the nothingness slash the body of motion, so it spins at a constant velocity all the time and no atom or force in the universe can change that fact as we have just explained. This is also important to keep in mind. Thus, I believe that the slower moving parts of the body of motion are not actually moving slower, they are like a man on a treadmill, running really fast but not actually going somewhere. Once the traffic jam clears, the slower moving parts pick up speed again, that is, the man gets off the treadmill and keeps on running. Remember, the constant velocity is so fast that we get nothingness. Therefore, in this new picture of the cosmos, the nothingness is the greatest force there is. I believe it is the source of gravity. Alternatively, the nothingness is gravity. Proposition 12, nothingness spins at a constant velocity for all time. From the point of view of nothingness, all time is now, which is the not, and it is hot. Proposition 13, nothingness is a force. The force of nothingness accomplishes free energy. Q, but how exactly? A, this is a new picture of the cosmos where the Big Bang is not a bang at all. The universe expands due to evolutionary mechanisms. In other words, the universe grows, I believe that this is dark energy. This is the whirlpool of nothingness making babies or copies of itself like the whirlpools in our oceans. That is, nature will tell you everything. In other words, the cuboctahedron, the torus, can be scaled. This is why the universe grows, like a baby in a womb. That is, evolution did not start at some odd planet in some odd galaxy billions of years ago. No. Evolution is older. Evolution stems from the beginning of time itself, which makes much more sense. The Big Bang and the Big Crunch in this work shall refer to the torus flow flowing out of the torus center, this is the Big Bang. The Big Crunch is when the torus flow flows into the center again. Thus, the Big Bang and the Big Crunch have nothing to do with the expansion of the universe. Thus, new mini bangs added to our universe would not rip open our universe and destroy it. If you pay close attention, then you will also realize that the beginning of time is not far away in some remote past. The beginning of time is with us in the present. And so we can utilize it. The beginning of time is when the torus flow flows out of the toroidal center. Therefore, there are trillions of beginnings of time as every atom may be a torus. However, our universe also has a beginning that was located far away in the past as our universe is a torus too. Our universe is the torus that contains all the other tori. You will also note that nothingness may birth new atoms that will arrive in our universe after the initial Big Bang. However, this does not mean that our universe is eternal because our universe is a torus and must therefore return to the state of nothingness, that is, the toroidal center, this is the end of time. Thus, there are many endings too. Proposition 14, the Big Bang is not a bang. 
Proposition 15, the bang did occur, but the bang is dark energy. Proposition 16, dark energy equals the fact that the cuboctahedron can make copies of itself, then the copies make copies and we get the exponential function that we call a bang. Proposition 17, dark energy equals evolution. This is what evolution is. Proposition 18, the beginning of time is with us in the present. Proposition 19, there are many beginnings of time. Proposition 20, new atoms will arrive in our universe after the initial Big Bang. So now we have a nothingness that spins forever. Free energy is simply this. Imagine you place a torus that is the right size into your car. The cuboctahedron, the torus, can be scaled like the octaves on your piano, so the torus comes in all sizes. Further, imagine that, in order to propel your car, your car ejects, essentially, atoms. These atoms are now the tori. Your car ejects toruses in order to propel forward. These toruses then get blasted into the environment and then picked up by larger tori in the environment and finally our toruses, our fuel, get sucked into the black heart of nothingness from whence they literally came, once upon a time. The tori must take this path because the force of nothingness sucks all things into itself, that is, all motion competes for a place in the toroidal center. This competition is what nature is all about. Nature's will to nothingness. The byproducts of this competition are space-time, the slower parts of the cosmic whirlpool, and dark energy slash evolution, the cosmic whirlpool that makes babies or copies of itself. A grip on reality here. What am I saying? I am saying that in order for the Tauruses to return to the nothingness, then we need to bend space-time completely. Initially, this would cost you all the energy storages in the universe if it were not for our new picture of the cosmos where the force of nothingness with its perpetual spin does this for us for free. Hence, free energy. The beginning of time is eternal order slash hotness. So our dead, cold, Tauruses will get revived again, become hot, in the toroidal center. There they are once more spewed out due to the eternal traffic jam. They can then continue to propel our car. Since, and this is the most ingenious thing in the universe, this is so ingenious. The center of any torus is the very center of the nothingness, then our torus in our car may eject from its center the toruses it once used to propel forward. It does not need to use the exact same tori, of course. It just demonstrates how free energy is possible by the eternal ingenious recycling that the universe actually is. Therefore, the tori you ejected will find their way back to your car, and they will be revitalized, and all for free. So you can use your fuel anew. That is some super fuel. Therefore, free energy is not about creating energy. Free energy is not about having this infinite source. Free energy has nothing to do with illogical perpetual motion machines, it is sad that I even have to write that down. Free energy is about recycling, reviving the dead and let the heart of nature, the nothingness slash cuboctahedron, do the work. Proposition 21, the torus comes in all sizes. Proposition 22, nothingness spends space-time at no cost therefore the body that is motion, nothingness, continues to move at a constant velocity unless acted upon. Therefore, the force that bends space-time is active all the time and it does not consume energy no more than it costs to move at a constant velocity unless acted upon. Proposition 23, the center of any torus is the very center of the nothingness. This must be so unless we can envision more than one nothingness. That there is only one center in the universe might also explain some quantum phenomenon like David Bohm theorized about. He said something like, there is only one fish. I.e., atom. Well, there might be many fishes, atoms, but only one center, which amounts to the same. Proposition 24, free energy is about recycling and reviving. My definition of free energy. The ability to drive your car forever without adding an external source of energy. In this work, the nothingness supplies your car with fuel. I would call this an internal source of energy. If these propositions are reasonable, then you may see how free energy is plausible. Also note that the cuboctahedron is actually a dual torus, thus, the secret of free energy might require two toruses. Proposition 25, if not free energy is true, then the recycling universe would die therefore the creation of energy is impossible. Proposition 26, we are not special in any way, and therefore we do not live in the first of all universes that eternity has spawned. Hence, we live in a recycling universe. Proposition 27, the second law of thermodynamics would effectively kill a recycling universe that cannot make new energy. The energy that is there is final and the second law of thermodynamics would kill it. Therefore, the only way we are here is because resurrection slash free energy is real. This is how nature is immortal. A note to Proposition 27, the energy is final, and the only way to continue using it, is to revive it. But the problem is, we do not have the energy to revive it. So another force must be operating, which I believe is the black heart of nothingness itself. In addition, this heart will never die as it continues to move at a constant velocity unless acted upon. Moreover, no one or no thing can ever act upon it. Space-time cannot act upon it therefore space-time is a part of it. Thus, the nothingness will remain a nothingness. In other words, the nothingness is immortal. The nothingness did not become space-time. Only a part of the nothingness became and is constantly becoming space-time, at which point the space-time is on its way to become nothingness again. The nothingness is with us right now. It does not lie outside the universe. It does not lie beyond the universe. In addition, it is not detached from the universe no more than the center of a whirlpool is detached from the other parts of the whirlpool. Therefore, the nothingness is within our universe, in the center of all atoms and black holes. Proposition 28, the cuboctahedron is immortality in the flesh. Proposition 29, 
the nothingness is within our universe. Proposition 30, energy is final and it is equals to the zero propagation of space-time. Proposition 31, we cannot change the picture, thus the nothingness is immortal. Imagine if nothingness has spun forever and there is no one else. Then, we have nothing or no one else to change the picture with. So the picture remains as it is. Proposition 32, the nothingness is within our universe. Proposition 42, free energy is real. Aftermath. Q, and you want to put that device in old grandma's car? A, yes. Q, have you thought this through? A, no I have not thought this through because, honestly, I do not know what I am actually dealing with here, which makes it hard to think through. I leave that to Nick Bostrom as he is an expert in the field of existential risks. However, I believe that we can have free energy that is no more dangerous than, say, having a battery that never dies, in the sense that the battery is resurrected each time it dies. But how dangerous is that? For the abstruse reader. I believe that the octave, e.g., from C to C, is actually a cuboctahedron if you include the black keys and exclude the last C. You get 12 notes which may correspond to the 12 converging lines that make up the cuboctahedron. But this is only a wild guess. Music is my hobby so I can but notice. The heart of nature, the cuboctahedron, actually looks a bit like a real heart. Maybe our heart is a copy of it. You know, nature copies what is. Do you want more esoteric stuff, zorabia.com.